This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at FBHP.com. I'm Mike Keith with my Titans Radio brethren, Coach Dave McGinnis, Rhett Bryan. We're going to pose for a picture here real quick. Picture. All right, picture right here during the OTP. Photo. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what a strange week it has been. A week unlike any other that we have had. Um I don't think there's any doubt about that. I was going back and looking in terms of how this departure of the head coach went. The distance of it is not totally different than, say, Mike Malarkey. Mike Malarkey was let go on the Tuesday after the New England playoff game. So it was two days. But he did have the final press conference on Monday – and you'll remember in the final press conference, he said essentially he wasn't going to make any – he didn't plan to make any changes on offense. And um, everyone kind of was surprised that he didn't come out and say that. And the next day he was let go. I don't know that everybody was shocked, Coach, because in Mike Malarkey's case, he was going into the final year of a three-year contract. And you either realistically had to extend him or let him go. Yeah, well, and there were, were, were there, there were some other things too after the the Kansas City game. Well, he and, had said after that yeah, game that I he mean, was. So you win your first playoff game in fourteen years. Yeah, fourteen years, and he had basically in his press conference gone into the fact that he was disappointed that ownership had not dispelled rumors about him being fired, potentially, and that wasn't that wasn't received well well and he took it to a personal level mike because he he talked about the stress that it brought on his family yeah because i was sitting in the room then i was sitting there going oh that that's probably not going to go well we were listening i can't remember where if we were already on the bus or where we were when we heard it and i guess we would have heard a playback on the bus but it was very odd it was a very odd tone and you were your your thought process then was whoa I don't know if this is the time to yeah you just won a playoff game yeah it's kind of like the old Jerry Clower line I don't believe I'd have told that I don't um, believe I'd have told that don't brother believe, yeah and he, from all my years in the league it's it's best to keep you've got a lot of thoughts just keep them to yourself until it's the right place to do it you know usually usually airing grievances in public. I think in any business is not good. Right. And especially a, a, a very visual and a very visible business. Just you can have the thoughts, but keep it to yourself in the right context. But Mac, how hard is that to couch and to to because that's clearly testing a person's patience because things are building and you might have frustrations or you certainly want to speak on a topic. How tough is that? Well, I've been there. And, and, I know and, you have. That's and, why I'm asking. And I held it in. You hold it in until you, and, and you know, and I did it, you know, for the fact that it, 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 in the end, it doesn't do you any good. Number one, and 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 secondly, you, you've got to understand that when you when you come out like that, you may be saying something off the cuff or something to get off your chest that is going to affect a lot of people. Well, and then they played another game the next week. And at that point, they go through the, the game, lose at New England, 35-14. to 14. The end of the season news conference is the next day. And then the news hits that, that they had decided not to continue on. on I guess it was January 15th. They decided not to continue on with Mike Malarkey. Uh, Jeff Fishers was actually 25 days after the last game. Yeah, that was a lot different. Very different. Mike Munchak's was actually six days after the final game. And, you know, the, the word was they asked him for some changes, and he had, he had closed the season well. They thought a lot of Munchak, but just couldn't get it worked out, and so decided it was best for all that he not continue. This, with Mike Vrabel's firing, was very different in that Monday became unusual. And it became unusual because there was not a final press conference which was outside the norm, and then people started to wonder what was going on. And then when the news hit about 11.30 on Tuesday, I still think it took people 
aback. Overall, I think the number one reaction before anything else was just surprise. Yeah, well, you never really know what's going on unless you're in the room. Right. And I've been in the room. And so I can speak from, you know, to, to Red's previous question, I can speak from experience. And, you know, there's a, a lot of conjecture normally around all of these things. I mean, it is. And it's, and, and, and you know, and, and the term Black Monday has become a big deal in the, at, at far, it's just nationally for conversations and stuff. But unless you're in the room, Mike and Rhett, you, you really don't know what's going on. You don't know. You can, you can surmise. You can have a lot of conjecture. And that's why it, it's always best if you're one of the, you know, if you're one of the principals, which I was at one time, is uh, just keep your powder dry and in the room because the rest of it, you can't dispel rumors and you can't dispel conjecture and you can't dispel people's opinions on the outside. Right. So everything you don't know unless you're in the room. One follow up to what Monday was the, the tell to me was that there was no press conference. And I think that's what immediately got people's radar up. So we had locker room clean out day and a lot of the media members were there. I was there gathering some audio myself and we had some players tell us there was no final team meeting. Tell me why that wasn't a tell or as big a deal as, as no press conference. Well, a, a lot of times you don't have a final team meeting just because of the fact that you have meetings, individual meetings. Right. And you'll, you'll meet with the, with, with, with the players individually, you know, as that goes on. Because in a, in a big team meeting, there are some – guys on the team that aren't going to be there you know they're they're not going to be there and so the individual meetings is what is really more critical than just an entire team meeting. well and that's what ryan Tannehill said too he yeah. said mike vrabel had done team gathering some years and other years he had not Correct. and in in my time here um and i was asked about it on the radio i guess yeah it was monday I don't remember that being standard operating procedure. I know it's happened some, but I didn't feel like that it happened every year. And then what Ryan Tannehill said backed that up, that Vrabel had done that some years and some years he had not. So I'm with Rhett, though. The press conference has almost always been held on Monday. It doesn't have to be. Correct. You have to hold one by the end of the week via league rules. But – um here, it's always been done the day after the game, as far as I can remember. I don't know if there was a trip we took at some point or there was a weather thing that had come up or anything. There may have been exceptions. But M maybe, but that's there was a reason for it. Right. There's a, it was the first time I could remember there wasn't a season wrap-up presser from the head coach. And I think the reaction among most people at that point is they're trying to work a trade. You know, that's what people kind of went to at that point because the majority of the speculation was that he was definitely going to be back outside the building. And then it was, you get to Monday, and then there's the talk of the trade possibility. But as you dig into that, it's, that's, uh, it was going to be, that was going to be a very convoluted thing to try to do. That's exactly the word I was going to use because it is. Right. It, it is. Now, people will point to, well, uh, Sean Payton was traded. He wasn't an active coach at the time. Right. He wasn't an active coach. He was under still under contract, but he was not an active coach at the time. But it is very convoluted, and it takes time. And plus, the, the principal and the parties in, involved has to agree to it. Well, and the other thing about the Denver thing, they had already been through their entire process. Correct. So they had checked every box. They had talked every, to everybody they Great wanted point. to. So they were done. The time constraint issue, because if you're sitting here, I mean, just hypothetically, you make a deal with someone, then the, you know they still have criteria they have to meet. Sure. Which is probably not going to be totally honest if you're interviewing people just to interview them because you have to meet requirements. I don't think anybody thinks that's really cool. I, I, the team, you know, the teams on either side wouldn't think that was very cool. I wouldn't think the league would think that was very cool. And it's just not right. The second part is, what if the other team pulls out? What if in the course of those interviews, they meet, they meet somebody they like better and they say, you know, we're just not going to do this because they're not bound to anything. And you, as the trading team, have to sit and wait because 
you can't start interviewing coaches while you still have a coach. That's uh, And see, all of that, you're laying it out very well, and people don't think about that. Right. And here's the other thing, Mike, that when you start talking about trading a coach, the first thing that comes to people's mind is, well, we're going to get first-round draft picks. Right. Wait a minute. You probably aren't. You probably are not going to do that. And so then you've got to negotiate the picks that you're going to get. There's a lot that goes into it. And so convoluted is a perfect word for it, but it, it's more intricate and detailed than people know unless you've been on the inside of it and, and know what all of that works. And everything in the National Football League is done on a timeline. Oh, yeah. There are, there are deadlines for everything that's done in the National Football League. And regardless of your circumstances – you still have to meet those deadlines, regardless of what goes on. I was thinking, and I totally agree, Mike, with the way the Rooney rule is set up and those things. I'm like, I, there's so many layers to this. It would it would be painstaking to try to do all of that. And, yeah, you're right. If somebody just says, no, we're not going to do that. We found our candidate. We like that. Uh, it's easier said than done, I guess, in this case. The thing, and I'm even thinking about all the layers to it, I would assume – much like when a team trades with another team for a player and picks or whatever, you know, all that paperwork has to match that they send into the league office. I would ha- say even that has to be the same thing to uh, go for the trade. hundred percent. And, but I, I go back, what coach said is the most important overlooked fact in all of this is the coach has to agree. Mm-hmm. Correct. And, Different from the player part. And of the, it. Re- the reality is if you were Mike Vrabel, why would you agree? Why would you not want to make them fire you so you could make your own deal? Even if it's with the team where you want to go, you want to make your own deal. You don't want to be tied into anything at this point. If your current team no longer wants you, then for, from, from the coach's standpoint, I, I'm not sure why a coach, yeah, just, any coach just, would just, agree. Thank you. Just insert any name in that box. Any name. Insert any name in that box. I mean – I was a coach for a long time. Insert my name in that box. You don't do that. And, Mac, let's take it a step further. Your representation wouldn't let you do that either. Let's take it a step further to go back to your point about you're not automatically getting first-round draft picks. No. Let's say hypothetically you are. Why would you go to a place where you're going to be handicapped and not have a first-round pick if it's in this year's draft? Why would you go to that situation knowing that you'd be behind the eight ball and trying to do player well, acquisition? Uh, you'd have to – you're assuming now that, that, that you're going to the place that you're traded to, you know, that is – But I'm just saying even in that hypothetical, I, I wouldn't even – I'm like, why would I go there? Well, but you look at it too. I mean, John Gruden wanted to go to Tampa. He told Al Davis he wanted to go to Tampa. When Al Davis called him and said, Tampa wants you, he said, that's what I want to do. Please do this trade. Bill Belichick was not going to coach the Jets. He resigned after 30 minutes or whatever. I resign as the HC of the NYJ on a piece of paper. On a piece of paper. Yeah. Right? He wasn't ever going to go there. He was going to New England because he had been there before and the Crafts wanted him. These were deals that were already In 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 place during a totally different time when the league did not have all of their rules in place. And it's not just the Rooney rule, which is part of it. But remember, this year, you cannot interview current NFL coaches until after the divisional round in person. In person. Right, right. Virtual you can do in a window. And what they're they're trying – not to interrupt, I'm sorry. But what they're trying to do – is they're trying to give coaches who go deep in the playoffs a chance to still be in the hiring cycle because everybody was making their hires before they could talk to every possible coach. So, I mean, they can't limit it out all the way to the Super Bowl. Maybe they do that at some point. But right now, it's just Zoom interviews. The Titans are about to start Zoom interviews. Some teams are starting Zoom interviews. And then, but you can't bring them in if they're a current NFL coach until after January the twenty second. And that's a yeah, big. That's the a Monday big, after the divisional right? round. You yeah. can start bringing them in. And that's a big point. It's a huge point. And and it's a huge point too that you need to be able to start those virtual interviews, right? Because that takes the place of an initial interview. When I was coming up in the league and then became a hot young coordinator in this, they would send uh, – the league would send a television crew to wherever you were and have someone come from the league and they would conduct an interview 
on camera with you. Tape it, you know, let you look through it and look at it, approve it, and then they would send it to the league. And then it was it was dispersed to all the owners. And they could, you know, they could look at that, but you never really got to talk to anybody until you were invited to come in for an interview. The all the rules have changed so much, Mike, as to what you're saying right there. But if you're if you're trying to to hire a new coach and you want to get in on these initial Zoom interviews, you got to start immediately. And you got to start quick, especially if the some of the candidates are still in the playoffs, are still in the tournament. Yeah, I, I understand what the speculation was about the trading. I, I get that totally. I don't think anybody was wrong. I just don't know that everybody fully realized what would go into it. They didn't. Uh, I mean, I didn't. I, yeah. I honestly, you know, I had to read some things and go over some things. And then the first thing I thought is, this is going to be really hard to do. But I didn't know that until I would delve into it. And it's funny you say that because I had the same thing as you have people at your office or people, your family, how does that work? Right? Like, I'm still kind of digging through that. Right. And you look at, I think there's been eight trades for coaches since the AFL and NFL merger in 76 of those in the last 24 years. And I'm thinking as, as structured as it is now, it's going to be even less of a thing. Like right. I, and somebody, I, I, the other day I was like, it, it's happened. It's just not frequent. And I said, I don't know that it'll be as frequent as it's been in the last 24 years. Well, to Mike's point though, it happened before these rules were in right. place. Yeah. And it's, and all of this has sort of continued and you're going to get, you know, people have asked, when will the Titans have their coach? You would think they'd like to have their coach by, you know, sometime January 25th, 26th, maybe Monday the 29th or Tuesday the 30th. But they might not. They might not. They might not. I mean, it may go, if you've got somebody you really want, then – you would be willing to, you know, kind of wait around during that process, but you will have some opportunities to make that contact and start to have some things in place because you've gone through all this up. Yeah, and by that by that dateline that you just brought up, if you don't have your coach, you're getting pretty close to having your right. coach and and knowing who it is. And I mean, I've experienced it. I mean, I've been to just about every senior bowl that's that's been since I've been in this league. There've been st- teams down there without a head coach now they were close to getting a head coach or maybe the head coach was hired while they were down there but it's not that's that's not the deadline you're looking at but as as you say you bring up a very very real point and back to my point about deadlines in the national football league that you got to meet there's there's, comes a point in time when you need to have one in place just so everything else can slot in yeah but i mean you'd like to have a coach by the senior bowl but you don't but you don't have to no you You, don't have to you do not and I mean, you, because all the scouting work and all the uh, all the leg work that goes into what the Senior Bowl is, what we're getting ready to do is go down there and look at the, that's been done ten months in advance, right? By your scouting department. Hey, Titans fans! It's always game on with Duncan. So grab a coffee and kick off the action. Whether that's drinking a cup of coffee on your way to the game or grabbing one to go before watching the game at home, Duncan is always there to help you get your game on. Just like the pros, we need to be at our best come game time, which is why Duncan is the most important part of your game day ritual because it's always the best call for football. America runs on Duncan. There it is. When do I get one of those? You want one of these? Yes. You can have this one. No, it's you're dirty. drinking out of it. Yeah. It's dirty. Uh, <laughs> so what I want to know of all of – Dave McGinnis, I want to know – of all of the candidates who've been mentioned that the Titans have asked to interview, how many of them do you have pictures with when they were children sitting on your knee or on a jungle gym or <laughs> a at a, jungle at a, gym. At, a, at a four-year-old birthday party? How many of these guys have you known uh, since they were born? With you and Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. First, first of all, first of all, I had a jungle gym growing up. I did too. And it was outstanding. It was outstanding. It was outstanding. We had the best jungle gym in the neighborhood. Yeah. And everybody came over there and kids broke their arms on them all the time. <laughs> And, they were the best. Oh, they were the best. They, to make them sign a they, were, they were so good and so unsafe. Uh-huh. And my grandfather bought us the biggest, most elaborate jungle gym, and my grandmother and mother were so mad at him because you got kids climbing up 
10, 12 feet off the ground. And what's on, so great? You play on metal. King of the Mountain and you try to punch the mm-hmm. guy off the top of the. Oh, jump. Yeah, I yeah. Shot, I shot my brother with a BB gun off the top of it and he broke his arm. Oh, so, God. Yeah. <laughs> and he still speaks to you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just barely. But, but bringing up Jungle Jim triggered me pretty much there. Okay. <laughs> you know, that stings too. I've been shot by a BB gun. <laughs> I have too. That, uh, that's not fun. So, anyway, I know, I know, I know a couple of them like that. <laughs> Just like, you know, before the Jacksonville game, Press Taylor came to the booth to see me. It was me. nice to meet Press Taylor. Press is good. Comes of a great family. Yeah, that was great cool. family. I've, yeah, he waited for you. He he's did. getting ready to coach a game, and he's waiting for Coach <laughs> Mack's segment to be over. He goes, oh, I can wait. So, I mean, but I've I've been in this realm so long, and there are, there are coaches' sons now that are coming up through the ranks that are pretty good football coaches. Yeah. It happens. So, how many of them? So, Brian Callahan's been mentioned. Well, I, 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 I knew his I knew his dad, Bill. Okay. you know very very well. He's still coaching with the Jets, right? He's a he's a he's a offensive line coach. Yes. Yeah. 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 He's one of the great offensive line coaches. Really good one. Yeah. Really, really good one. Of course, the one I know the best is 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 Slowick, Ryan Slowick, because I work with I work with Bob, his dad, for three years. He was uh, when Dave Wanstead took over for. Mike Ditka and I stayed with them after Mike Ditka was let go. Uh, Slow was with Jimmy Johnson on that staff that won those Super Bowls in Dallas. And then Slow came in and was a defensive coordinator. So I've been around the Slowick family a lot. Very, just a real great family, football family. His brother Stevie is in the personnel department in San Francisco. If you if somebody hires Brian Callahan, do you think his dad comes as the O line coach? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, that That's would be interesting, right? Package deal. Package, well, I mean, you <laughs> kind of want that, wouldn't you? He's pretty good. Yeah, he's pretty good. He's more than pretty good. Yeah, he 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 gets it. And he's been a head coach in this league he's and in major college. And yes, he he gets he gets. But you know, I, offensive line play. I'll just say this for Bill Callahan: he gets it. Yeah, he gets it. Um. So let me move to something different. This is something I do, and this is kind of one of the crazy things that I do every year, the day after the season ends. Crazy? Crazy, indeed. So I do – I run the key stats for the playoff teams. Nice. To to compare what they're doing. And, you know, some – a lot of years we've been in the playoffs, which has been great. This year we're not. And I was going to share a few of them with you to see okay. if you think they make sense. The, the obvious one when you start on offense is points per game. The average playoff team, 24.8 points per game. Makes sense. Titans, 17.9. So it's a touchdown. It's a touchdown a game. Yep. And Which in a one-score game makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. But that's your standard. You would You would kind of expect that, I would think. If you take Pittsburgh out, that number goes to like almost 25 and a half points a game. Pittsburgh is the Pittsburgh is the team offensively in the playoffs that would be the below the norm. Below the norm. Yes. The one at the top would be probably Miami. Miami. But anyway, 24 points. But you know what? And that's a little bit skewed for this reason. And I and Miami had a 70 point game. They did. They had a 70 point game, which go ahead. They did. But they also had a couple of 14-point games. Yes, sir, they did. <laughs> All right. Um, rushing yards, I don't think, is a is a big deal at all. Uh, the average playoff team, 121.5 rushing yards per game on 28 carries. They averaged 4.31 per carry. The Titans, uh, 108.6 rushing yards per game on 26 carries. They averaged 4 to a carry. They were behind a lot, so they didn't get to run it quite as much. But if you're looking at yards per carry, about the same. About the same. So the the run the run game doesn't seem to be an issue. The pass game, however, playoff teams average 237 yards passing per game on 33.6 attempts with 22.2 completions. So they average to complete 65 percent of their passes. And the playoff teams average nearly 28 touchdown passes. Uh, I was waiting for the touchdowns. Yeah, okay. The Titans averaged 180.4 yards passing per game. 
17.6 completions out of 29.1 attempts. Titans complete just 61.5% of their passes. So they're 4% below the what the playoff teams are, right. which means the clock doesn't keep running. Obviously, All it's, of that. it's a misplay. League average is roughly 64%. So the Titans were under the norm. And the Titans just 14 touchdown passes. Half. There Half. it is. Half. Then they're, and they're – now you're starting to dig into something. Now, here's a couple more. Uh, playoff teams averaging 36 sacks allowed. Titans, 64 sacks. Playoff teams convert 43% of their third downs. Titans, 33.5% of their third downs. Big difference. Yeah, big difference. Um, Titans, okay on turnovers. 20 turnovers. They're actually below the playoff team's average of 21.7 turnovers for an offense. So they were – I mean, if you'd have told Mike Vrabel before the season his team would only turn the ball over 20 times, he'd have taken that. Yeah, in 17 games? Yeah, absolutely. You'd have taken that. Um, red zone success, playoff teams average 59 red zone trips, nearly 59% touchdowns scored in those red zone trips. Titans, 48 red zone trips, 48% touchdowns. And there's a difference. And there's the difference. Defensively, when you look at some of these numbers, it's pretty interesting. Uh, playoff teams allowed 20.2 points per game. The Titans allowed 21.6 points per game. Negligible. That's, that's not a big deal. Um, playoff teams allowed 319.5 yards per game total offense. Titans gave up 335 per game. Yardage is... Yardage doesn't mean anything, right? Correct. Uh, run defense, the Titans were actually better on run defense than the average playoff team. 105 yards rushing per game on 25 carries for a 4.15 per carry average for a playoff team. Titans, 107.7 on 28 carries, 3.8 per carry on rushing. And I think we felt that during the year. Yes, yes. Um, pass defense. Playoff teams, 214 a game allowed, 63% completions. They allowed 23 touchdown passes. Titans, 227 yards per game allowed, not too bad, but nearly 68% completion percentage. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a continuation of series yes. right there. And 20 touchdowns allowed. So not, not terrible on no. the touchdowns. No. Playoff teams averaged 49 sacks per game or per, per team. Right. Titans had 45. Playoff teams, 14 interceptions. Titans with six. Yeah, and that's a big difference, too. Big difference. We, we talk Titans were just as good on third down as playoff teams. Playoff teams allowed 38.4% of opponent third downs to be converted. Titans, 38.5%. Exactly the same. Yeah, exactly the same. How about red zone defense? Red zone defense is interesting. Um, the opponent, the playoff teams allowed 51 red zone trips with 29 touchdowns, meaning the touchdown ratio was 55%. The Titans allowed 61 red zone trips, probably too many, but only 23 touchdowns. The touchdown rate was just 37.7%. Titans number one in the NFL. That's number, that's number one in the league. And that, that, that right there counterbalanced some of those other ones. It did. That, that's why you had your one-score games. That's right. Um, average takeaways for playoff defenses, 24. Titans with 14. And there's a, there's a huge difference there. Average turnover ratio for a playoff team, plus two. Titans, minus six. And uh, another one I ran, average penalties per team for playoff teams, six penalties per game, 50 yards, Titans seven for 52. The same. But there's some there's some significant ones in there. There are some significant and, and you ones. You can see how a game seesaws. And so when we talk, I mean, all of the things that we present on Titans Radio before the game of, of here's, here's what might happen, here's what has to happen to be able to win, you can see the counterbalance in, in the things that we talk about as far as third down success, as far as, you know, limiting explosive plays as far as scoring touchdowns once you get in the red zone, making them kick field goals on defense when you're in the red zone. All of those things come out. But the turnovers in the National Football League, and we always talk about turnovers and explosives are huge things. 
Yeah, the other thing too when you run numbers like this is the it it is staggering how much less the run game means than it did even 10 years ago, maybe even 5 years ago. It's it's much more about the efficiency and the success in the passing game. Well, and but the but the run game has to complement it cuz at some time, yeah. And at some time, you're going to have to be able to run it. But to be, to, to to say that you're going to lean on it the whole time, uh, it just doesn't happen in the National Football League just because of the way the rules are set now. And some of these numbers, rushing numbers, are skewed, too, because of quarterbacks running. A hundred percent. The thing that has shifted to me in all of that, because, Mac, uh, you know, you're right with the way these offenses work. You've got to have three down backs to make all that stuff continue to, to gin. But, you know, uh, it hadn't been that many years ago, Mike. If you ran the ball by committee as a team, you're almost looked at as like, what's wrong with you? You don't have a bell cow? You don't right. have a stud back? What's wrong with you? But the whole thing Now was, it's the way of the world. Yeah, and, and that's and that's where it really is because when you – well, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Let me mention SeatGeek is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans, so Titans fans can fan. Yeah, you, I mean, you're right. Because I've done some work on that, too, as we get ready to go into this fascinating offseason. It is going to be a fascinating one. And you talk about the Titans. It was going to be that before yeah, this week it got, it got more fascinating oh on Tuesday. Oh, my word. Um, so Rand Carthon and Anthony Robinson and Chad Brinker and whomever the new head coach is and probably some guys who continue to work in all of those areas, they are in a position where they are now going to be able to reset the valuations for this franchise in terms of the salary cap. Absolutely. And this is the first time that I can recall – that somebody has had a chance to set the philosophy here at least, because it feels like we've always been battling the cap forever. Last year, certainly battling the cap, but you're going to sit down and you're going to attach a value, not just to players, but to certain positions in terms of how this game is played now. Yeah. And, and that, that is a, is a very relevant point. Because, first of all, I'm excited about this offseason. This offseason is going to be exciting because you have a chance to do that and you have the assets to do it with. But, you know, I talk to a lot of people and they say, well, the Titans are going to have a whole lot of money to spend. I said, there's a big difference in having a pot of money and then allocating those assets so that it's beneficial not only at the present but in the future. Well, that's the you, yeah. you can't take that money and just be a drunken sailor on leave and just be throwing it out of your pocket. You cannot do that. And as you said, this is a time right now where you've got a chance to reset a lot of things. Well, you've got a chance to set yourself up going forward for the next four, five, six years. Which is a window that you're looking at anyway right. in the National Football League. And there's it's no secret to any of us or the three of us sitting here, the people behind the camera, the people listening to us. One of the major things is you've got a young quarterback. That's it. You've got a young quarterback. And that is the axis that everything revolves around when you talk about resetting your money. Well, and, and his cap hit, in the next two years, Will Levis's is under five million dollars, which is, and then Tajay Spears, as your lead back, his cap hit in the next two years is less than three million dollars. Which yeah, is, when you're visualizing that pie chart that people use, like, look at the Broncos and what the piece of pie is for Russell Wilson right. and the quarterback. To go back to your how much positionally you allocate, and you look at the – I mean, it's vastly well, different. Well, but let's say – all right, let's say Will Levis becomes really the dude, that he becomes that guy. In 2026 – Will Levis is getting paid. Sure he is. And I you, mean, I and mean, you he, want him to. He, I mean, that's going to be if, – if he becomes that guy for what quarterbacks cost, he's going to be $50 million. I mean, that's what those guys cost now. 
And just to think what it will be in two more years. And again, with the caveat that the salary cap is going to escalate. It is going to escalate. Every year. And the thing that's important, too, we went through a very, very strange time with the salary cap during COVID. Right. That was that that was a retraction. And a lot of these contracts were made not knowing that the whole world was going to catch COVID. And so now we're catching up and we are we're speeding up to that. So your point is very well made, but you're going to have the assets, too, to do that. But you still, because of this reset moment, have the ability to know that if he takes off, you're going to be able to pay him and not have to take the team apart. A hundred percent true. That's the whole thing they're doing right now with the valuations. I mean, Tannehill and Henry last year against the cap combined cost roughly $53 million. And, you know, the ex, I mean, Tannehill played well here, didn't have a great 2023, but he had played well up until then. You signed him to the four-year contract. He earned all of it. Henry got the four-year contract. He earned all he of earned it. earned all of it. But what are you going to prioritize in terms of where you're putting your money and your assets, knowing that you have to do that not just for 2024, but for 25, 26, 27. So at some point, I mean, you've got a chance if you do this right, because the cap's going to be going up, and because you're doing this reset, that you don't have to take the team apart. And here's the thing. Now you, can, now you can set your asset allocations without being forced to do something. Right. That's the big plus. Well, and I mean, I think that that's probably where the decision's going to come in on Derrick Henry's future. It's it's not it's not can he play? No. It's not do you want to pay him as a star? It's do you do you invest in the position understanding that you can take money elsewhere if you don't invest in the running back position. Here, here's a question I have for you, Mac. As they're assessing this situation, knowing that we don't know what the cap number is, I've seen reports of it going from 224.8 to 240. It's supposed to be 240. Yeah. Are they making evaluations based on what it is currently, and then if they get extra, that's just icing on the deal as when that cap number is released? Or are they are they working on an estimation? They're working on a, a, a middle estimation. Okay. They don't go. They don't go with the because you know it's going to increase. Right. But you, so but if you, you go middle it, of the road, you and go then middle of the road, yeah. and then if you then if okay, you have that makes it, sense. You have it. You have it. But yeah. you don't go on what the baseline is now because you know it's going to increase. You just don't know how much. But the Titans are not going to spend up to that. No, anyway. you don't do that. That's not what you do. I mean, because that's the thing that's the misnomer in this is it's like, oh, you've got two hundred and forty point eight million that you can spend. You've got to spend two forty point six. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, again, that's what this moment is. That's exactly right. Is this is the moment where this group who uses analytics, who uses different evaluations for position groups, different lengths of contracts to understand what this is going to be, understanding what your future has. The, the biggest thing that potentially has happened for the Tennessee Titans – is they may have hit it with Will Levis. That, that's huge. And if you've hit it with a second-round quarterback for two years, it's absolutely fantastic. Now, you don't get a fifth-year option with him, though, because he wasn't a first-round pick. Correct. So you're going to – I mean, there's going to have to be a contract in year four. You know, you understand that. But you can plan for it. You plan for it. And here's the other thing. You want him to be that dude. Mm -hmm. Because if he's that dude, then – Everything else that you've allocated around him, if you do it correctly, you'll be able to get where you want to get. But it will also affect what your draft strategy is. A hundred percent, it does. It, it all it all goes together. And you know, and and again, when you're in it and done it, I've cleared a cap before. I've done I've done all of this. You've got to be able to project. And now you're going to make some mistakes because you're dealing with human beings, sure. both in your instance and in the people that you're evaluating. But you've got to be able to you've got to you've got to be able to layer this thing so that you're never up against all of a sudden you, you talk about 240 million. It's like buying a house, you know, for five million dollars and you spend all five million and you got nothing to pay the bills with. You can't do that. 
you've got to you've got to piecemeal the thing together, but do it do it uh, intelligently so that you're not ever putting yourself back up against the wall again. Yeah, you've just cleared your credit card balance down to zero, and you're not going to max it out again. You're going to figure this thing out. I don't ever remember the Titans doing this. Do you, Rhett? No. I can't remember an inst. I can't remember an instance where they have had this moment. The closest that have been since I've been with the Titans. Now I've been with uh, another club when I was a head coach, where we had to clear the books, firebomb the whole thing because it was just out of out of control. I started looking at that cap and I about passed out. <laughs> but here. The only time we were ever close to that is when we had, when we lost Javon, we lost Samari, we lost, you know, all of those guys, you know, lost Eddie, lost Mac, God rest his soul. All of those guys, we lost those guys. And all of a sudden you're sitting there going. And so, you know, the, the two years after that were really piecemeal together, but you were able to bring in the David Thorntons. You got Chris right. Hope, you got Kevin Mawai, and then you drafted, you hit on some draft choices, and all of a sudden then you're back you're back to ten and six, and then you're back to thirteen and three, you're number one. So it can be done, but you have to be judicious with your money and your picks. And your strategy. You've got to make a decision on what your strategy is going to be. And again, I use the word valuation. There you go. Because that's the part of it. You know, it, it was as if people when when the Titans let Janu Smith go, people were like, "How can you let Janu Smith go?" I said, "You're paying a running back. It's a choice. It's a choice. You go to Kroger, and you you've got so much money, you can buy one thing, but you can't buy another. That's the way the cap is. That's the way the cap if is. If you if you paid Derrick Henry, which made total sense for where they were at that moment, sure, a hundred percent." then you make a decision that you can't do other things. Now, is that the same decision you make now? We'll see. I mean, we'll, we'll see how these guys see the cap, but it's going to be fascinating in that way. And I think it's going to be something that factors into, to who the new coach is. If he kind of buys into what they're, and I mean, I don't know what their thinking is on this. No, I I haven't. I mean, I haven't talked to him yet about it. No, and I won't ask. I, I might won't. ask. Yeah, well, you I can. Might. You I can because you're Mike Keith. I won't I ask. I don't know. The thing, the thing that I do know is, though, is you've got a chance to reset it. Right. You see, that's different. That is different than having to, than having to, in banking, having to go borrow again to pay right. the loan that you just had. It's different. Now you can completely, as Rhett said, you can go to ground zero and reset it with a strategy. You want to add? What would you like to add, Red? I don't have anything else to add. You, you're good. Well, then we just end, good. we're just going to end this. Red, I wish you'd add something again because I like sitting here talking to you guys. That's fun. Well, I just I, I'm glad we've had this 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 OTP because there's some questions that I think that I wanted to know, and I thought the OT people wanted to know about the process of a lot of the structural things we're discussing because, man, I you know. This stuff, I'm not a very smart person at all. It's way over my head. I had a guy ask me, he goes, so they got, you know, 200 and something million under the cap or whatever, and they, so we can get like three players. It's like, no, 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 no. Now, I know it doesn't work like that. Whatever those numbers you see reported of a four-year deal for a player. Right. And I'm like, I, I don't know how to convey this to you because, again, I'm not a very smart person. But I was like, that's not how that works. I said, First of all, you're a smart person. Well, thank you. Uh, I wasn't fishing it for a compliment. Someone finally disagreed with him. That's good. No, you are you are a smart person. But the salary cap, you can you. I've done it. You start digging into the salary cap and manipulation of a salary cap. It'll cross your eyes. But the thing is, they don't have to play any games with it right now. That that was my point. They don't need a bunch of trick things or voidable no they've cleared the blackboard that's the whole thing of the giant math problem that's the whole thing and And, they can start and amy adams strunk has empowered this group to do it to do it yes and that's what i think is the big takeaway from where we are right now as we as we start the process just like she chose to empower someone else to make the decisions last offseason about several veterans. That's why she changed general managers in December 
is because she wanted someone else to come in and look at it with a new set of eyes and to make the decisions that they made. And they, you know, they let some guys go who were well thought of players, guys who'd done a good job, had to eat some dead money in order to do it. Um, wasn't easy, which is why they weren't going to have a lot of extra money to spend last year. And now you're you're starting the building back process, knowing that you have Jeffrey Simmons and you have Harold Landry and you have some guys like that. And then you have this group of rookies who played a lot of football, who seem to be people that can help you with the foundational parts of your roster. And now you've got to, you know, you've got to go after offensive line. You've got to go after wide receiver. You've probably got to go after secondary. All those things you would think, or those three areas you would think factor in right away. But you can. But you can. But you can. And the the thing about that is that you're saying is that's so true. You don't have to you don't have to start making choices either this or that. Either this or that. Right. If you do it right, you can spread it out. And you could have both. You could have both. And depending on what happens, I got as you're saying that I'm thinking about who could be here, who could not be here. The median age of this team is going to be quite young. Yeah. You know who has the highest median age in the playoffs? Miami. Yeah, a lot of those yeah, they, defensive guys yeah, they've that have to, some age on them. So Monday is the deadline for underclassmen to enter the 2024 draft. So we'll know who the underclassmen will be. Uh, Senior Bowl week starts on January the 29th. And uh, Shrine Game week starts a couple days before that. Um, February 20th, Tuesday, February 20th, clubs can designate franchise or transition players. Mm -hmm. The combine begins Monday, February 26th. Um, the franchise transition player designation window closes on Tuesday, March 5th. That's also when college pro days can start. That's also when players can take 30 visits to NFL facilities and can interview with teams via video or telephone. The quote-unquote legal tampering period for free agents... Which I love. Begin, I love that term. Begins on Monday, March the 11th, and then the 2024 league year and the top 51 rule goes into effect Wednesday, March 13th at 3 o'clock. What did I say when we started this whole OTP? The National Football League runs on deadlines. Yeah, and then league meetings, the big league meetings, which is the, the spring get-together, uh, in Orlando, March 24th through 27th, and then Monday, April 1st, clubs with new coaches may begin the off-season program. So that will be here. There is – a deadline for everything you do in the National Football League, and the train stays on that schedule. So that's why you've got to jump on it and go. And then the annual player selection meeting in Detroit, Thursday, April 25th through Saturday, April 27th. Capital Gabba coverage on Titans. Right and here. then, and then uh, pre OTAs, and then. Uh, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, yeah. OTAs, and then training camp. And I can't wait for all of it. It's going to be interesting. Gonna it's going to be different. It's going to be interesting. Interesting I, and different. I'm all in for it. For Rhett Bryan and for Coach Dave McGinnis, I'm Mike Keith. Thanking you all for joining us for the OTP. Sign up.